I'm starting the live stream. That takes a couple of minutes, so my apologies. All right, there it goes. All right, hopefully you can see this. Good. Awesome. I'm going to stop my video now. All right. Okay, so thank you all for, for joining me this morning. So this morning we're going to talk about solar eclipse photography and... I'm hearing myself. This is great. Technical difficulties. All this tech and it's a pain in the butt. <laughs> oh, All right, you now. couldn't do without it. Oh, no. God forbid. <laughs> All right. All right, now I stopped yapping at myself. Okay, so once again, thank you all for joining me this morning for the Solar Eclipse Photography Workshop. As I noted, I put this together to prevent people from hurting themselves on, and their equipment, mainly their eyes. Um, we're going to cover the gamut of solar photography you can photograph the sun at any time. We tend to forget about the big ball in the sky as a subject for photography, but the reality is it's a wonderful object to photograph at any time, as long as you do it correctly. Um, we have a lot of filters at our disposal that help us save our eyes, save our camera, and really discover the magnificence of this incredible star, which is our own. But before we get started, just a couple of things in terms of housekeeping. I have an upcoming work, actually it's a photo tour in Acadia National Park at the end of May. It's a five day photo tour of probably my favorite place to shoot the stars. I'm primarily an astro landscape photographer. I am obsessed with the night skies, the galaxies, anything star related. And this is gonna be primarily uh, focused on night photography, but it's not just limited to that. The area is eye candy maximus for any photographer. So we'll be shooting the gamut of the beautiful splendor of Acadia National Park. So I hope um, you can join me. Some of you know about my extreme of a fascination, uh, more like obsession with lighthouses. And uh, a little over a year ago, I put my energies to put together a book on lighthouses. And if you have a friend or someone in your life that is obsessed with lighthouses, uh, this might be a nice gift for them. And it's available in hardcover and softcover in on high quality art paper, as well as Amazon paperback. In December, I published a book, that's actually a handbook on infrared photography. This covers the um, spectrum, bad pun, of how to select an infrared conversion right to uh, visualizing infrared and also post-processing. So if you're a long time infrared photographer, and you still struggle with the whole process, this might help you. And if you're uh, some, someone who's thinking about getting into infrared, this uh, peels away the onion, which is un infrared photography. And surprise, Lighthouse, I am obsessed, so uh, I, I apologize for it, but I have an upcoming photo walk at Beaver Tail Light. This is a sunset into Star Trail photo uh, photography photo walk. This is in Jamestown, Rhode Island. Yet another lighthouse at Ned's Point Light on April 13th. Same thing, similar premise, sunset into star photography. 
and I have an infrared photo walk at Lars Anderson Park on April 19th. So let's get cracking in for uh, solar eclipse photography. So we're going to cover a lot of things today. I'm going to talk about the types of eclipses, uh, specifically solar, even though there are lunar eclipse, eclipses, this is all about the sun. We're going to talk about planning resources and tools that you have at your disposal to plan, the types of photography, the challenges of shooting the sun. We'll talk about gear and settings. So eclipses. There are actually uh, three specific types, the total solar eclipse, the annular solar eclipse, and the lunar eclipse that we're not covering today. But this here, these are the these two are the ones we're going to cover in detail. So for solar eclipses, we have the total, the annular, and the partial. But the partial goes hand in hand with these two. So it's not a separate entity on its own. It's something that you see in conjunction with totality, depending on where you are. So the mechanics of the solar eclipse, you probably know this, but being an OCD type of person, I like to um, give information for folks that may have forgotten or not aware of why things happen. But the solar eclipse happens when the sun, the moon, and the earth line up. And the um, we see the solar eclipse in a very narrow band on the earth. It's basically a little shadow of the moon that traverses the, the planet. And this shadow is called the umbra, and it's a very, very narrow path. Now, the rest of us uh, see the eclipses more or less through the penumbra. The penumbra is the, the wider shadow that encompasses a greater area of the, the Earth, uh, of the shadow of the moon on the Earth. And when we're talking about the... Um, the totality or annular eclipses, we're talking about how the shadow is um, affected on the Earth itself, this narrow band. So the total, total solar eclipse, which is the one that's coming up on April 8th, it's, a, it's the rarest type of solar eclipse. All solar eclipses occur at the new moon phase. And for a total eclipse, the total appears to the moon appears to be the same diameter as the sun, and you can only see the totality in the umbral area, that narrow uh, dot of shadow that traverses the Earth. And we see the partial eclipse from the penumbra area, that wider um, area of shadow that hits the Earth. Just like the total eclipse, the annular solar eclipse happens only at the new moon phase. And annular eclipse happens when the cone of the new moon uh, umbra doesn't reach the Earth. So it, the, the moon appears to be a little bit smaller than the sun itself, so it doesn't cover it completely. And you end up with this, uh, this, this rim or ring of light around the moon. Just like the total eclipse, you can only see this in the umbra area, very narrow path on the Earth. And also you can see the partial eclipse anywhere within the penumbra area. And this is the partial solar eclipse. This is something that probably most people in their lifetime experiences because it, it's visible in a wider area. And it's because the, the moon never covers completely the sun, it almost looks like a crescent moon or a crescent sun. This is a, a pretty cool video uh, that I came across that uh, gives you a space view of what the eclipse looks like. And I thought it was pretty cool to, to share. So there's the moon going over the sun. totality. And this is what it's going to look like on April 8th for the North American eclipse.
and there's a shadow, very narrow shadow that traverses the earth. It starts in the Pacific, first point of contact is Mexico, and then it traverses across the continental US, over the Great Lakes, into Northern New England and into the maritime provinces. So how do you plan for this thing? Well, we're lucky. Te technology is a double-edged sword. It's a pain in the butt, but it also gives us a ton of information at the tip of our fingers. But you have to also be prudent in where you search for information because there's so much bad information out there. Website, Sky and Telescope is probably my favorite um, place to look for information, anything celestial oriented. I've been reading Sky and Telescope probably since high school days, so a very long time. And their website is chock full of information. However, as most nerdy things are, they're not well, um, well integrated in terms of their search engine. So if you're looking for anything on Sky and Telescope, I recommend using Google as the search engine. So type in Sky and Telescope and anything that you're looking for, say the total, total eclipse 2024, and it'll bring you right to the page. If you use the search engine on the Sky and Telescope website, you'll end up with a ton of stuff and you're probably not gonna find what you're looking for. So just a little tip there. There's a great little website called Eclipse 2024 that is uh, loaded with information sp and regarding locations and everything else under the sun, no pun intended. It's a great website. And I'm going to give you some information regarding the stuff that you can find on that website. Timeanddate.com is another great website regarding moon, sun, anything regarding um, the eclipses, uh, seasons. It, it's really good place to find a lot of information. Um, and this is what is given right now regarding the total eclipse on April 8th. So this little red dotted line here is the actual path of totality. And it's pretty narrow. But that's all the locations that are under this red line are the places that you can see the total eclipse. As you get further away from this red line, you can still see the partial eclipse, but probably not covering the sun to the extent that um, clearly the totality would offer. But you can still see the eclipse in all this area. So pretty much all of North America has visibility to this eclipse. Short list of uh, other eclipses that are happening this year both lunar and solar eclipses. We have a penumbral lunar eclipse coming up um, right this month towards the end. Of course, we have the big kahuna, the total eclipse on April 8th. Then we have a partial lunar eclipse on, in September. And then we have an annular solar eclipse on October 2nd, but that is only visible in the Southern Hemisphere in South America. So if you're traveling anywhere, in this locale and in this time frame, you have a possibility of seeing an annual or solar eclipse. So eclipse2024.org, this has all of the locations, be it states and provinces that have the uh, visibility to the total e eclipse. So being in New England, you can see the eclipse in northern New Hampshire, Maine, Vermont. Uh, if you want to go to upstate New York, you can see it there. And if you're going into the Maritimes, these are all the provinces um, that can see it, including Quebec and Ontario. And in uh, Mexico, the first point of contact is actually in Mexico. And the longest duration of totality is actually in Durango. Eclipse 2024 also gives you maps of where the totality is visible. So keep in mind that the blue line here is where you have the greatest length of totality. 
As you get further away from this blue line, the time of totality decreases. So say you're looking at Dover Foxcroft, probably the totality length of time is very short. Pretty much three minutes is three minutes plus is the time frame that totality is visible along this blue line and it diminishes on either side as you get away from it. This website also gives you information regarding um, geo positioning. So take a look at this. So for Abbott, um, start right at the top. It gives you the longitude and latitude. And you see these, um, def uh, these nomenclatures fairly often for eclipse. So for total eclipse, you'll only see C1 and C2. For annular eclipses, you'll see a C1, a C2, C3, and C4. And C1 is the point of contact of the moon on the sun, figuratively. Um, so at the point in time, the shadow starts going across the disk of the sun. So for this town, it, the, the moon starts moving across at 2.19.45. It enters totality at 331.08. So two, C2 is the beginning of totality. And the duration of totality is 1 minute and 50 seconds, 50.2 seconds. So looking at this list here, you can see that totality ranges um, from 3 minutes, 22 seconds, all the way to... 21 seconds. So you can tell that this town is right on the fringe of totality. You can see totality, but it's very short lived. So keep that in mind when you're planning. Uh, keep a close eye on how long the duration of the totality is and make adjustments accordingly. This also gives you the altitude of the sun, the angle, and also the azimuth, the, um, the degrees from north. So it's in the 200s because it, the sun's going to be in the west. If you're photographing the eclipse in uh, Texas or Mexico, the eclipse is actually happening in the morning. So the numbers are less than 180. So this is what gives you the indication of the direction of the sun. Uh, Savannah, a uh, quick question. Someone yep. asked if someone asked if you have information for uh, Burlington, Vermont. I suppose that's on the uh, Eclipse uh, 2024 website. Is that right? Yes. And uh, actually, Burlington is um, something that I have on my radar. It has about uh, three minutes and 20 seconds of totality. It's right in the path of uh, totality. Um, like strong, like a, a good duration totality. But yes, Burlington, Vermont is um, there and all the towns in Vermont that are affected by totality are listed as well, including Maine. You can see that and it's all on this website. It's kind of a, 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 a kludgy website and meaning that you think you're going someplace, but you're not. Just keep at it, keep clicking and you'll find where you need to be. And if you're having problems, please feel free to reach out in terms of finding information on this website. It's, again, it's kind of, um, doesn't flow well, is what, what I'm saying. Thank you. Thank you. So what to expect during a solar eclipse? I found this uh, handy dandy little chart from the National Science Foundation. And it's a really good um, little chart that gives you kind of an expectation of what's going to be going on. So totality minus 75 minutes, you make sure that your filters are on. And nothing really changes in brightness. As the moon starts going across the sun, you start to see things that are a little bit different in terms of the light that is around you. Um, you can start seeing uh, crescent disks of the sun shadows on the, uh, on the ground. 
Um, so it's kind of funky to see how it looks. And the, the lighting is very different. As the light, um, the eclipse progresses, you'll start seeing this kind of effect. It almost looks like a very thin crescent moon, but it's actually a very thin crescent sun. And it feels, the light feels like a very cloudy day. It feel, just is very strange and um, very interesting looking too. It's very bizarre. You can almost see in, you know people freaking out in the past on what was actually happening. At T, uh, totality less one minute, you start looking for Bailey's beads, which are these bumps of bright light on the edge of the moon. And it's really cool looking. And keep in mind, your filter is going to stay on this entire time. Right, And then right before uh, totality begins, you see the diamond ring. And the diamond ring actually happens twice. It, begin, it happens at the beginning of totality, and it also happens at the end of totality on the opposite side. And make sure that your filter is on during this time. At totality... This is the only time you can remove your filter. And this is when you can see the corona of the sun. And seeing that we are in solar maximum now, the corona should be pretty impressive and very big. So something to uh, get excited about. And during totality, keep an ear out to the birds. The birds behave differently when the light changes to that degree. And it's very interesting. And the, keep an, look at the light as well. It's very, very different than anything that you've ever, ever, ever experienced. It looks very strange. Right before the sun emerges, meaning right before the second diamond ring occurs, make sure that you put your filters back on and your sun, your eye, your, your sun shades back on. Totality is the only time that you're able to look at the sun with your naked eyes. And this only applies to total eclipses, never an annular eclipse. Any questions on this before we keep going? Okay. So when it comes to anything celestial, especially something like this, the eclipse, make a plan, then make a plan B and even a plan C. And if you really want to get uh, extreme about it, even make a plan D. So be sure that you have more than one plan because you're gonna have to pivot pretty rapidly to a second plan in case of um, bad cloud cover, rain and the like. Start watching the cloud forecast probably around three days prior to the eclipse. And this is why we have many plans, because if, uh, say, you're, you're planning on going to Burlington, Vermont, but you know, the forecast looks pretty dismal, you want to have the ability to say, OK, I'm going to be going to northern Maine instead because the weather's going to be better, or going to upstate New York because the skies, the seeing is going to be better. This is all about having locations predetermined uh, in case you need to pivot. There's um, apps that are very helpful in terms of determining totality as well as cloud cover. And we're going to talk about those. So Astrospheric, uh, those of you that have taken workshops with me know all about this app because uh, it's probably my favorite app for um, cloud forecasting. Uh, this app is free. It's also available. Uh, you can see the forecast via their browser and it's free and subscription based. So I subscribe um, it's 99 cents a month, very cheap. And you get, instead of getting one cloud forecast, you get four. So it gives you a better idea of the probability and weather is all about statistics. And if you live in New England, you know what a crapshoot it is. <laughs> so the more tools you have under your belt to reference, the better off you are. So what does Astrospheric give you? Well, it gives you cloud cover information. As noted, if you get the free version or you look at the website, it's going to give you one 
uh, forecast model, which is the Canadian uh, Meteorological Cloud Forecast. If you subscribe, you'll get four. You'll get the Canadian model, you'll get the North American model, the European model, and the RDPS model, which is a cloud cover um, specific forecast. And it gives you live um, view of the cloud cover. And it, you can also see in the future for the lack of a better word. So this is the, the clock, 24-hour uh, clock. And you can tell that when I took a screenshot of my phone, it was pretty cloudy throughout the day. So you can select a, a time and you can see the percentages change over here, for instance. Okay, so I looked at, I took another screenshot on a different day when clear skies were being forecasted. So this is a screenshot at the point in time I didn't change the, the, the time. It, it will show you current um, conditions when you open the app. And at that point, you could tell it was pretty sucked in. Then I clicked at on 12 for noontime, and you notice that the color changes. So if it's blue, you're a happy puppy, clear skies. If it's completely white, then you're not too happy. So pray for blue. And this will notice the cloud cover percentages have vastly uh, decreased. So, and they're pretty much in line. Sometimes you'll see that two forecasts are the same and two of them are like off the charts opposite. You have to weigh it and decide, okay, which way am I going to go? Am I going to believe one or the other? So it gives you insight. Nothing is 100%, but it's better than nothing. Highly recommend you download Totality. It's a free app. It's available on Android and iOS. And this is a great little app because it gives you a lot of information regarding timing on the fly. So um, when you open the app up, it, you hit start, and then you go and select what you want to see. So um, in this case, I clicked on what's the closest totality near me, and it came up with um, these coordinates, and it gave me all kinds of uh, information regarding the beginning of the partial the start of the total period, uh, at what point it's total, uh, the eclipse is at maximum. It gives me the altitude or the angle of the sun, uh, the azimuth, it gives you all kinds of information. So let's look at this. Remember I said about C3 and C4. So C3, this actually lists it. C3 is the end of totality and uh, C4 is the end of the partial, but more often than not, you only see these, um, the starts and not really the ends, but this gives it to you all. So this is, again, totality, and it, you can select the nearest totality, the longest eclipse, and you can actually get to Google Maps and you can drive to whichever location you want. It actually gives you coordinates. As I noted before, Durango, Mexico has a four minute and 28 second duration. And it takes about a little over uh, a day and a half to drive from New England to Durango. So that's a possibility for you. Any questions so far? Uh, so I had one question. I think it was back to last on that chart that showed uh, the phases coming up to totality and you were describing whether to leave the filter on or not. Question is, what happens uh, What happens if you did leave your filter on during totality? What do you get? You get total darkness. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. Which, if you're using a wide-angle lens, you do in a landscape mode, it may not be a, a bad thing to, to register. But we'll get into that. So how do you plan? Say you're you're you want to understand the the direction of the sun. What kind of um, uh, focal lengths to take into consideration? Um, I'm specifically 
referencing Planet Pro because it's the app that I use the most for planning. You can use photo pills. You can use the photographer's ephemeris. Those are like the, the big planning apps. Uh, but this is the one that I find that has the most um, bells and whistles and the most flex flexibility and um, ease of use, in my opinion, once you understand how it, how it all works. But at any rate, looking at a planning app, it helps you understand which way the sun is going. Um, so right now I'm looking at Plano, Texas. And for the eclipse, it's going to be like a, a late morning eclipse in that area. And it's going from top to bottom because it's the sun is rising. For us in New England, it's just the opposite. But this gives you a, vis uh, a, a, a great way to have visibility to things. We're photographers. I know I am incredibly visual. You can talk to me and I don't understand you. If I see it, see something, I immediately understand it. So this is the value of a planning app. So looking at this at 28 millimeters, I'm right at the edge of going off the frame if I want to photograph the entire eclipse. So that's not really cutting it. So I need to consider what my goals are. Now, looking at this with the same focal length using landscape mode, but now I am in street view. Now I can see the feasibility of doing a an image with a uh, foreground object and where the sun's going to be. Still, it's not going to uh, encompass the entire um, duration of the eclipse, but it might be fine because I'm able to photograph the point of totality but not the whole enchilada again something to think about and we're going to dive heavily into planning uh further on so uh, for Savannah, yeah. the question is can you can you do ir photography of the eclipse absolutely absolutely if you have a an h alpha camera converted camera that'll give you even uh, a different perspective um but yeah, definitely, if you have an infrared camera, definitely put it to work because I'm planning on shooting with mine as well. Definitely. Good question. So let's talk about shooting. This is actually a totality in 2017. Um, kind of see sunspots on the, on the edge on the left-hand side. So if I get anything, if you remember anything about what I'm covering today, when photographing the sun, safety is your number one goal, bar none. More important than the shot, keep your eyes safe uh, and keep your gear safe. We have expensive gear. We, want, we don't want to, um, you know, have smoke coming out of it. <laughs> so things not to do. Do not use stacked ND filters. Uh, some folks use stacked ND filters, and it was problematic last time around. So it's not going to block what it needs to block, and it will damage your sensor if, if, if you're not lucky. Do not use your normal sunglasses. Make sure that you use ISO certified shades for your eyes. Do not use polarizing filters. Do not use smoked glass. And do not use CD or DVD discs. The last eclipse, I saw a lot of these weird little comments on what you can use to 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 uh, shoot the solar eclipse or look at the solar eclipse. A um, lot of bad things happen. It it was not good. So avoid. If you have a welder's glass, depending upon the density of the welder's glass, you can use a welder's glass, but you have to make sure that it meets the constraints. So we had this question early on. Um, so I have this lens, it's a 500 millimeter lens and it has a drop-in filter right here. Never use this, never use a drop-in filter when photographing the sun. Secondary, we have drop-in filters now for mirrorless cameras. Also, never use this type of filter when photographing the sun. 
And this is the reason why. Remember when you were a kid, you would play with a magnifying glass on, uh, on a sunny day and you would figure out how to put a hole in a piece of paper or perhaps a leaf with a magnifying glass. And basically the magnifying glass is converging the rays of the sun to make a hole. Your lens is pretty much this magnifying glass. So if your filter is not on this side, the converging um, to protect this end of things from the converging rays of the sun, you will burn a hole in your sensor and very rapidly. If you don't, if you put a, um, a, the filter here, like the drop-in filter or a sensor filter, this is pretty much what you're doing. So that filter is not going to do anything to protect your sensor. So this is the reason why you never use a drop-in filter or a clip-in filter on a mirrorless camera when photographing the sun. Does this make sense? This is probably the most the most important thing. Okay. So solar filters are required. <clears throat> Probably going to hear this a lot from me today. So never photograph or look at the sun without protection. Full aperture filters. Uh, these are the ones that are specifically made for telescopes, but they come in all sorts of diameters, and they can easily go over a telephoto lens, and they, they, are, they, they work fabulously. They've been around for a very long time, and they're... Uh, built to stringent um, uh, standards, and they are phenomenal for uh, photographing the sun or just even viewing the sun. These come in glass and polymer film, and they look kind of like uh, these weird little discs with ears. They come with three ears, and these are plastic knobs that just gently um, get snug around your uh, um, hood. And I use my hood on with these filters. You could probably put it directly on the, the lens itself, but I find for myself using it on the hood works out well because I can put gaffer tape without being, you know, o the OCD me doesn't freak out putting tape on my hood, but it does freak out when I have to put it on my lens, even though I still put it on my lens, but that's, further down the pike here. So these come in two types. So when you put this on, definitely use a piece of gaffer tape just to add a little bit more protection against potential gust of wind coming along. And if it's strong enough, it, it you know the po possibility of popping this thing off is there. The nice thing about these filters is, is they come off very quick at totality and go back on very quickly at the end of totality. Get these from a reputable source. Kendrick Astro Instruments, AstroZap, Celestron, Orion Telescope, which is Mead, and Bader Planetarium and Thousand Oaks Optical all make these types of filters. They also make in, um, specific lens filters lately. These are relatively new where they either make the, um, the lens filter like a screw-in type with the glass or they embed this film in between two pieces of glass or just on one side. So these are, are the makers of actually these types of filters. Silvana, which one is better, the glass or the polymer? They're both equally good. I find that the glass ones, um, because they're glass, they're more resistant. Um, the thing with the po the polymer ones, you have to be careful that if you accidentally whack it and you put a tear in it, you're basically, um, you know, that, that thing is toast and you should never use um, a filter that has any holes or uh, cuts because that pretty much um, opens the can of worms for danger. But they're both very good in terms of protection. Of late, and this is fairly recent, um, these didn't exist before, but filter manufacturers are now producing solar filters. 
These are threaded filters that go on your lens like a polarizer or any other kind of uh, a filter. These are specific in terms of ND strength. Um, these are ND 100,000. They're not 10,000. These are 100,000. So keep an eye on the number of zeros when you're looking at these to purchase. You want to make sure that it's ND 100,000. And uh, Case actually has um, a filter where it has a magnetic um, holder, which allows you to pop this thing on and off very rapidly. And it comes self-contained. So this filter comes with the, the, the filter holder that, get, that gets screwed onto your filter, I mean, your lens, and it works pretty well. These are the most, you know, they, they work great because they're like traditional filters. So I suggest buying one for the, your largest lens, and then you can use step-up uh, adapters for your other lenses. There are many brands now that make these type of filters, uh, Case, Ice, Hoya, Celestial Optical, KNF, Nissi, Heda, Tiffin, and there's a few others that make it as well. These are 16.5 and 16.6 ND filters. Now you can use them after solar eclipse time or shooting the sun because of their density. They're very, very dark, um, so you can do long exposures. But what I've discovered is um, they're even darker than, you know, just taking a 10 and a 6 and taking a shot. Um, so play with exposure, but you can definitely use these after the fact. Definitely recommend, again, using a magnetic filter holder because that will allow you to um, fumble less at totality to remove and then put the filter back. I caution with these filters because they don't have a safety rating like the uh, full the full aperture filters do make sure that you only use live view on dslrs unless they're actually cutting ultraviolet and infrared rays they can damage your eyes on a dslr because it's reflecting the light from the mirror right into your eyeball so these are fine for cameras but just be careful for your eyes um, when you're using a DSLR. It's a non-issue for mirrorless cameras because a mirrorless camera doesn't have a, a mirror. It's not reflecting anything. What you see when you look in the viewfinder is actually what the sensor is capturing. So nothing's re being reflected back into your eye. So I think the only one that I've seen that actually has a, a, a comment regarding blocking UV and IR is Nissi, and I don't know to what extent. So don't assume that they're completely safe. They're fine for your camera, but not necessarily for your eye. But again, just use live view and you'll be fine. Magnetic filter holders. Um, Right now, um, I'm seeing more manufacturers popping up with these type of, of uh, holders. Zoom, for the longest time, was the king of magnetic filters. Um, I have a lot of these, uh, the Zoom uh, systems, and they work phenomenally well because they are strong and they keep the filters on, on your lens. Now, Thanks to the parent company of Zoom, they decided with their infinite wisdom to stop making them. Um, but that's a rant for the, another day. But um, Case makes a very good one. Uh, you can just buy the adapter and um, it pretty much allows other filters to be quick release type of filters. There are other brands as well, but I can't speak to how well they work. Um, but I know case is pretty good in terms of strength. Focal length. If you're looking to get a nice big fat sun image, you want a 300 millimeter or stronger lens. Critical, you want a good tripod, something solid. Um, consider uh, putting weights on it as well to make it even more stable. And we're going to talk about um, the, the, the importance of a good tripod. Consider using a gimbal head. Ball heads are nice, but 
uh, if you're uh, juggling a, a big rig with a long lens, they can be a pain in the butt because the, to keep a long focal length lens fixed on the sun, it's not easy because the moon, I mean, the sun is constantly moving. Actually, we're constantly moving and it is too, but that's another story. It quickly goes out of field of view. So if you're using a gimbal um, or a gimbal type head, similar to this Manfrotto here, it's a lot easier to keep things aligned because the uh, lens and camera are balanced on the unit and it's a lot easier to move and not get out of whack rapidly. Intervalometers, uh, these are great because they allow you to trip the shutter at slow shutter speeds. Um, so don't, if you don't have one, definitely consider getting one. You don't have to buy your camera brand like the Nikon or the, the Canon ones. These are like 160 bucks. Just go to Amazon, 20 bucks. I recommend the wired kind um, because they don't lose connection to the, to the unit that sits on top of your camera. They're more reliable, long story short. And they work well and um, they get the job done. And they also have the uh, extended capability of extending your shutter speed and doing interval timing shooting if your camera can't do it internally. So these are a nice investment on the cheap. Make sure you have fully charged batteries and formatted cards. Cards, especially if you're planning on shooting the time, uh, doing a time lapse. Make sure that your card is big enough, and we're going to cover that in detail. Freshly formatted and large enough. It, one thing that is problematic when you're doing long duration shoots is running out of juice. Um, so. Think about what the capabilities are in terms of duration for your camera. It's a non-issue if you're not shooting time-lapse, but if you're planning on shooting a time-lapse, you want to be able to keep continuous power being fed to your camera so you don't have a, a, a gap. So there are ways of doing this. You can either buy a, a dummy battery and um, this plugs into one of these units, which plugs into a power bank, and it will power your, your, your camera. You have to make sure that your camera doesn't have, um, doesn't block the, the power. Now, for instance, um, I have a, uh, well, I have many cameras, but for, for, for our, um, discussion's sake, I have this power bank here, it is. It has like the intelligent power um, mechanism. Excuse me, where it feeds the power continuously, and it's clean power. It's not going to cook my camera. Now I can use this unit with a dummy battery on my D850 because and it's the same battery that I can use on pretty much all of my my cameras except for my Z9 because it has its own um, different uh, type of battery but from camera to camera this will may will work or not work be, because depending on the camera it requires much more power to flip into live view so it won't work so on my D800 which is my, one of my infrared cameras, this will not work because this doesn't have enough power for the camera when it goes into live view. It, it works fine on my D850, my D780, and even my Z6. But I guess the D800 requires much more uh, power at the point in time it flips into live view that it does not um, have enough. So something to think about because you're going to be photographing in live view with the DSLR and if you're going to be using one of these power banks for a time lapse, you want to make sure that it can flip your camera to live view. Um, so my D800 will work fine as long as I'm not in live view, which is a problem for eclipse photography. So just let keep this in mind when you're using external power. 
Now, there are other cameras that you can plug the power bank directly into the camera and it keeps the camera's battery um, going for a long time. Like on my Z9, I can plug this in and I have no problem powering the camera for hours at a time without changing battery. So see what your camera's capabilities are and go from there. ISO certified safe shades. Make, so, make sure that you get one of these. Um, they're cheap and they're uh, make sure that it's ISO certified because that's the only way you can really look at the sun and not have damage to your eyes. Star trackers. These are optional. If you have one, consider using one. This eliminates constantly moving the camera as the sun goes out of view because it tracks the sun for you. It's a tracker. And the only caveat to this is it needs to be polar aligned, and we're going to talk about this extensively as well. Then all you need is a chair, some snacks, and I left out the glass of wine that's usually there. So thing to keep in mind, don't go out and weld all your gear on April 8th and expect that it's going to go smoothly. Um, because the time uh, length is so critical, you want to practice and practice a lot before the eclipse. Since you're not really shooting the sun a lot, I mean, I shoot the sun, but even for me, which I've been shooting the sun for years, because it's not something I often remember to do or do often, it, it's kind of a clunky thing. Make sure that you are practicing with your gear, with your with your um, filter, um, because the more comfortable you are with your gear pointed at the sun, the more successful you will be come April 8th. Again, and I keep saying this and you're going to get sick of it, but please do live view on your DSLR to further protect your eyes. Uh, gaffer tape. Gaffer tape is something that should always be in your bag. Um, and use your lens hood. We're going to talk about using uh, gaffer tape on other things as well today. Settings. Basically, ISO 100 to 400. Your f-stop is going to run f5.6 to f16. And your shutter speed, which this pertains specifically to totality, that's when it's going to change a lot. It's going to run the gamut from uh, an, an eight thousandth of a second to one second because you're going to be bracketing. Make sure you're shooting raw. Uh, make sure that you're not shooting JPEG for this event. You want to have the most uh, data at hand when you're post-processing, and you don't want the camera to decide what it's supposed to look like. So make sure you're shooting raw. Believe it or not, the sun is not easy to focus. You would think something that big would be easy to focus, but it's not. It's probably the most uh, difficult thing to do is to get the sun sharp. So keep an eye on the sunspots because those are the ones that will give you an indication on how good your focus is. Once your focus is uh, achieved, flip Flip your camera to uh, manual focus, either in the body or on the lens or even both. Um, that way, if you accidentally hit the uh, focus button, you're not going to whack your focus. So make sure that you flip to manual focus and then tape down the lens. This is where, you know, my OCD kind of freaks out because it's tape on my precious gear. But Gaffer tape is a great tape to have because it doesn't leave any residue. Don't use duct tape or painter's tape or anything like that. Make sure it's gaffer tape because it's specifically made not to leave residue behind. And this pre prevents lens creep. Now, my lenses, I don't have experience, bad experiences with lens creep. Um, but when you have your lens pointed up for a very long time, Better to be safe than sorry. And, you know, lens creep will blow your focus. So make sure you just use a piece of gaffer tape um, and lock down the lens so it doesn't misbehave on you. 
once your focus is achieved, pause off the lens. You're done focusing for the duration of the eclipse. The sun is super bright, so you don't really have to play with exposure during the eclipse uh, from the like you know, from the onset right up to totality. At totality, that's when things change rapidly with the with the the exposure. So keep an eye on your histogram and bracket. Once you get to totality, bracket. If your camera's capable of doing seven or nine uh, uh, levels of bracketing, put it to that and fire off different sequences. So say you start off at um, 250th second exposure, fire off a, a, a set of exposures, bracketed exposures at that point. Then change your exposure again, fire off another set, and keep on doing that so you have like a breadth of exposures uh, that you're probably going to get something, uh, more than something that's going to be uh, perfect, but at least this covers the 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 wild exposure range um, that in, you need to get totality and the the beautiful corona at that point. Now, one thing to think about too is when you do this type of bracketing, it also lets you potentially get a picture of the moon with Earth uh, Earthshine on it. Earthshine is when the the sun that's reflected off the earth bounces off to the 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 moon and you'll get the features of the moon also apparent so in post you can combine all these images and create something really cool with the corona of the sun and also have the features of the moon visible in in the frame so c keep earth shine in mind as well for totality use a teleconverter if you have it Things to keep off is long exposure noise reduction and ISO noise reduction. Just turn them off. Um, you don't need them, and all it's going to do is delay everything because the, the camera is going to be processing for you on the side, and you don't need to do that right now. Again, DSLRs, cover your eyepiece. If your camera has a little um, lever that puts a little um, shade in the eyepiece, make sure you turn it on. If not, take a piece of gaffer tape and block the eyepiece. That prevents you from automatically looking in the eyepiece, which is second nature to us. And consider using mirror up. Um, that way you don't have the clapping of the mirror at the point of time that you're doing long exposures and you're not introducing um, shake for that one second exposure at totality. Um, Set your camera to continue with shooting because you're going to be firing a lot of frames at totality. Not so much during the beginning and end of the eclipse, but at totality, you want to have that, that camera humming uh, as much as you can because it's a very short span of time to accomplish a lot. Use your external intervalometer and stabilize your tripod and make sure it's level. Use weights to keep that uh, tripod uh, firm and, you know, it helps with the gravity, keeping that tripod tight on the ground. Consider shooting double or even triple fisted. If you have more than one camera, consider shooting the gamut, different perspectives, uh, wide angle landscapes, uh, different focal lengths. Granted, you're going to be needing more than one filter. But if you can, definitely consider shooting more than one camera. And practice, 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 practice before the eclipse. You'd be surprised at uh, how awkward it is to photograph the sun when you don't always do it. And this only applies at totality. This does not apply to annular eclipses. This is only for total eclipses. Um, <clears throat> consider using an alarm to signal when to remove the filter. That way you're not always looking at your uh, watch or your phone and you know um, you're not missing the, the experience of the eclipse. So consider using an alarm. Then bracket, as I noted before, bracket five and even more frames. If your camera is capable of doing more, do more frames. 
and you're going to bracket ISO 800 to 100 to 800, and again, eight thousandths of a second to one second to capture the the range of um, exposure, and then perhaps use a stopwatch or a, a timer to signal when to put the time the uh, the filter back on the lens. Th these two things are are critical, so you don't um, miss the opportunity and, and damage your, your camera or even your eyes because you're going to be putting your sunshades back on too. This is a handy dandy chart uh, from Alan Dyer. If you don't know who this gentleman is, definitely check him out. He is an astronomer and uh, he does phenomenal uh, work. And this is a, a great chart that is in his How to Photograph the Solar Eclipses uh, handbook. And basically, this is pertaining to totality. So depending on, um, you know, diamond ring, this is right before totality is when, you, before and after totality is when you get the diamond ring. So um, you're shooting at very high shutter speeds. Then the prominence, the, those uh, little uh, bright red uh, prominences that appear on the edge of the disc. Um, you're still shooting at very high shutter speeds. Then you get into the corona. These are very diffused, very diffused light. So you're you, you're using um, either a slower shutter speed or a higher ISO. So just keep in mind. And um, this is this is, all applies again to totality. And this is what we want. This is our goal. So think clear skies because this is what the corona looks like. There are this, these are the prominences and there's the moon. Now this image doesn't have uh, the earth shine but I've seen some images of totality where you get the beautiful corona, the prominences and you can actually see features of the moon thanks to the earth, earth shine and these are things that you can combine in post. Any questions so far before we get into composition? Uh, Silvana, somebody asked, um, was it, is, did they make filters that are large enough for the, for an F4 600 length? Yes. Um, for those, well, that, the, the 600, Hmm. You probably the Sony how, I would recommend getting a, a full aperture for that. Okay. Because um I don't I don't believe it has a a, a wide enough um you won't get a filter with the diameter big enough for that. Okay. Let's see hide. All right. Uh, another thing too is. If you, I haven't seen any drop, not drop in, but you know the the uh, 100 uh, millimeter by 100 millimeter square filters that you can put in a holder or uh, the 150 and 150 filters. I haven't seen anything in terms of those type of filters um, that are available specifically for the sun. So I think your your best bet is a full aperture filter. One other question, uh, Silvana. Um, oh, you spoke about the an external intervalometer. Uh, is there a benefit? You, you don't you don't need that if the camera has your own its own intervalometer, correct? Correct. But so any, it, any if you, benefit to have an external one? Uh, the 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 benefit would be by tripping the shutter. So the the whole idea of using an external trigger is to ha have your hands off the camera when you're doing a long exposure. So say you're 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 going to be doing a 1 second exposure. Right. If you trip the shutter, even though you have a built-in intervalometer, unless you have your camera set to uh, exposure delay, so your camera stops, doesn't trip the shutter until 2 seconds go by, you basically lost 2 seconds while it's waiting for the camera to stabilize and trip the shutter. The external uh, shutter release or the intervalometer, which works as a shutter release, allows you to trip the shutter without touching the camera when you're doing that one second exposure. 
Right, that understood. Okay. Okay, so let's talk about framing the sun. What are your goals? Are you looking to get big sun images, like uh, uh, an image that fills the whole frame? Are you looking to get a, um, a frame of the sun, uh, but the way we see it, meaning we have a, a landscape view of the, of the scene? So think about what your goals are, and then you can plan uh, much easier. And you have to pre-visualize. We're photographers that are visual people. So the more you're able to pre-visualize what something is going to look like, the easier it is to decide what your goals are. So think about um, how it will look using different focal lengths. Uh, think about where the position of the sun is going to be um, and go from there. So again, here is planet. And these are different ways of determining, uh, actually one way of determining how something's gonna look. So here is, um, clearly we're, we're looking at the Northeast now, cause now we're looking at the sun as it's going down. So now the, the sun is in the West. What's it gonna look like using 20 millimeter? Well, okay, with 20 millimeter, I can get a foreground that's a possibility. And since the the um, the eclipse starts at 2.14 p.m. and ends at 4.37, with a 20 millimeter lens, I can get the full range of the eclipse using a 20 millimeter lens in portrait mode. That's an option. What else can I do? What will it look like using 50 millimeter, but in landscape mode? Well, now, because I'm using 50 millimeter, now my time frame has shortened. Um, I can still get the, the whole uh, eclipse, but now I won't have a foreground element. Is that okay? I have to think about that. What's it going to look like at 100 millimeters? Now I can start seeing the sun a little bit better because now I'm using a longer focal length. But now my um, I'm basically focusing in almost uh, entirely on the period of totality because I'm not going to get much on either end, the beginning or the end of the eclipse. OK, at 300 millimeter, now I'm getting a big sun, a bigger sun. That's a possibility. What else can I do? What does 400 look like? I'm getting an even bigger sun with 400 millimeter. So you have to think about what you want to capture. 500 millimeter, you're gonna get a nice big fat sun. So think about what your goals are and what you wanna accomplish for this and what you wanna capture. So before we get into Trail of Suns, any questions? Okay. Uh, there are one or two. Uh, Go ahead. Someone, uh, one person asked, uh, what's the best all-around ISO to, if you don't want to be changing it, ISO all the time? What would be the best all-around ISO? Hello? I'm thinking. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, well... The only time that you'll be changing it is at totality. So if you don't want to change it, uh, I would say stay with 100 up to totality. And then at totality, um, go to 800 and jack up the speed. If your camera can't do um, like a um, an eight, like one eight thousandth of a second at that speed, you're going to have to drop the ISO. So let's let's look at the chart so if you want a specific time a, a specific speed and you're only changing the um let's see 200 looks like the one because it'll handle the diamond ring at very high iso i mean uh, shutter speed and most cameras can go up to one eight thousandth of a second 
So 200 will cover the gamut um, of shutter speeds that you're going to be needing when you're shooting from the diamond ring uh, to, um, you know, and doing the Corona. So 200 would answer be, be the answer for that one. Was there another question, Dan? Uh, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, should, should, this one, it says, should you stay with the same focal length for the whole arc of the eclipse from partial totality or after? And when it when's a good time to try different focal lengths if you have only one camera? I think that question is entirely up to you. Okay. Um, if you're looking to shoot... A trail of suns, you're not going to be able to switch your focal lengths. Um, if you're looking to only capture the sun at uh, just just the sun itself without any um, type of other photography like a sequence of suns or time lapses, then you can do it whenever you want. You can just swap it out at will. But if you're looking to do specific types of photography, you're going to be limited in terms of your ability to swap out lenses. Okay. Was that the last one? I believe so, unless someone wants to chime in, but I, uh, oh, what, someone says, when is a good time to practice? To, what, you know, what's a good day? I guess a nice clear day when the sun is brightest. What's, when's the best time to practice? I would say um, practice when the, the, you know, at any time, any time when the sun is up be, at the beginning or the end of the day. Um, if you want to get used to have shooting at a particular angle, figure out a where you're going to be shooting the eclipse. Look at the angle of the sun at that point of like where it's going to be 40 degrees or 49 degrees. And then, Right now, figure out the time of day that, that the sun is going to be at the same angle and shoot. That way it'll get you accustomed to that. So, Anna, uh, why use a uh, lens hood, which makes it tougher to get those magnetic filters on and off? Is there an advantage there? Um, When I was talking about you using the lens hood, um, I was talking... And my apologies, I was, I was talking about using the full aperture um, solar filter. For the magnetic ones, yeah, you want to have your uh, the ability to flip that thing on and off very rapidly. And oftentimes, the filter is going to be probably oversized for the lens that you use. So you you don't use the solar hood, uh, the, the lens hood. So that's thank you for bringing that up. That was confusing. Silvana, you mentioned IR. Uh, what is the best IR wavelength to use, or would you use full spectrum? I would say use full spectrum and also do a 680 filter if you have one, because that gets you close to H alpha. Thanks. You're welcome. Uh, Silvano, how do you combine continuous shooting with bracketing? Well, the, what, you're going to be, because you're going to be needing continuous shooting in order for it to, to bracket. Um, or if you're in single mode and you're in bracketing, it's going to probably throw an error depending on your camera because it can't fire continuous rapid shots. Right. Any more questions? Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's talk about shooting a trail of suns. We've all seen those photographs where you have um, a sequence of suns all in a row, and they're beautiful. Okay, so how do you do that? Well, you need to know how fast the sun uh, moves. So the sun moves a full diameter every two minutes. It's pretty fast. So in order to use... Um, keep that in mind and get a, a sequence of suns, use an interval of either five or 10 minutes for composites because they're going to be individual frames at, you know, every five or 10 minutes and then you combine them in post. 
make sure you have your solar filter in place for these shots. You can show, uh, shoot totality without the solar filter. So just, you know, while it's getting to the uh, next, uh, you have to time it carefully though, because you the thing's going to be an interval timer shooting and you're going to pop the filter off and you're going to have to play with the, 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 uh, the settings um, because you want to be able to do that totality um, while it's shooting. So there's some dancing involved, or you can even choose to leave the filter on and just have it totally black. It's entirely up to you. But if you want to get that Corona, you're going to have to pop that lens, uh, the solar filter off and then start doing the, the, uh, the dancing with the, the bracketing and that's okay. But just keep that in mind for this type of, of uh, eclipse. Use an intervalometer, internal or external. This is where you just set the camera and have it shoot shoot every five or 10 minutes and it just does it. And then once you get all these uh, photographs, you can bring them all into Photoshop or any photo, uh, photo processing tool that you use that does layers and you just use the light and blend mode and it'll put them all together for you. As I mentioned before, totality is the the thing that is probably the most difficult part because you're going to have to bracket and you can use either a wide angle lens or a zoom lens for uh, using a, you know creating a sun sequence think about your framing and keep trajectory in mind again uh, if you're shooting in the in New England area it's in the the sun's going to be in the west and the sun is going from uh, it's going downhill so it's going to go down instead of up if you're in the south and shooting in the morning. And think about using a planning app because that'll help you visualize it. And are you going to uh, shoot the entire eclipse, meaning the beginning right to the end, or just a portion of it? Entirely up to you. There's no uh, right or wrong answer. It's what your goal is. And... Um, Let's talk about how it's going to look. One thing to keep in mind, the higher the sun is, the wider angle of lens is needed when you want to get the whole sequence from beginning to end, which is about two hours and 20 minutes of uh, eclipse time. Keep in mind, we tend to shoot landscapes and landscape modes um, naturally, but think, keep in mind that portrait mode may work out better uh, depending on how high the sun is and practice. This is where uh, the earlier question said, you know, when's the best time to practice uh, for this? Well, if you're um, going to be framing the sun and you're going to be shooting a sun sequence, you want to be able to practice shooting when the sun is at the same angle as the sun will be on April 8th depending on where you're, you're going to be. So keep that in mind. It's pretty easy to figure out too using a planet planning app because if the sun is at 40 degrees, then you want to practice when the sun is at 40 degrees. And that will give you a really um, a big comfort zone when it's time to actually shoot the eclipse. So here is, again, planet, and this is where you're looking at the angles. So um, the planning app will tell you the angle of the sun. So at the beginning of the eclipse, the sun is uh, at about 49.2 degrees. Since we're facing west, we know, that, and it's afternoon, we know the sun is going to be going uh, down. So at 326, the beginning of totality, the sun went is now at 40.6 degrees. At maximum totality, it's at 40.4. At the total end of totality, it's 40.1. And at the end of the eclipse at 4.37 p.m., it's at 29.4. So it went steadily down. I mean, it, that's a big difference between... Um, the beginning and the end, it's 20 degrees, and that's substantial. So this is something to keep in mind when you're practicing. Keep a close eye on the, the altitude, the angle of the sun. 
And what's it going to look like? Five minute interval and 10 minute, 10 minute interval. That's hard to say. So 50 minutes, actually 50 millimeter. So if you're shooting at 50 millimeter, this is what it's going to look like at five minutes. I mean, a five minute inter interval. So they're pretty close together and you can get the whole sequence of the time of the, the solar eclipse with a 50 millimeter lens. You just have to plan it correctly and you know place the sun in the right spot to get the whole thing. Now using a 10 minute interval, you get the wider space between, which they're both beautiful. Looking at a 35, milli 35 millimeter lens, using five minutes, you get a look like this. And at a wide angle lens, because you get that distortion, you get a little bit of an arc. 10 minutes, you get a wider type of placement of the sun. This is a really cool shot, 1999, um, single frame. This is actually shot on film. And this is an annular eclipse. It's not a total eclipse. So he kept this filter on for the duration. And this is the kind of effect that you'll have if you decide not to take the filter off at totality. You'll just have it dark. But he shot this, uh, Kira Fuji shot this um, early morning. As you can tell, the trajectory is going up. It's a morning eclipse. And uh, fantastic that this is on film. Any questions about um, sequences before we get into tracking? Okay. Using a tracker helps keep the sun in the field of vision the entire time because it's, it's staying with the sun. So you don't have to fiddle with constantly adjusting. The thing about tracking uh, trackers is that it's designed for astrophotography, which means that you need uh, polar alignment to happen. So a lot of trackers require the use or visibility of Polaris in order to properly get it aligned, which is only visible at night. However, if you have a compass that gives you true north, you can do this using the sun to track. So align it with the sun, make sure you have a compass that gives you true north um, information, and you can use a plan, uh, planning app like Planet, TPE, photo, photo pills to get the altitude, longitude, and azimuth in order to line up the tracker correctly. You don't have to be precise the way you have to be precise for uh, star photography. It can be very rough. It doesn't be, have to be totally accurate. As long as you're in the ballpark, it'll it'll do its thing. Sky and Telescope has an excellent article on the steps of alignment, and this is the link here. If you just Google Sky and Telescope, uh, Polar Align in Daytime, it'll bring you right to the page. But um, there, um, the directions are, are very good. If you have a Benro Polaris, and I have a Benro Polaris and I love it, you can set up Polaris normally. Um, make sure that the tripod is level, and this applies to any tracker, that, that the, the tripod has to be level or else your tracking is going to go, it's going to nosedive. So um, use the app calibration to get to um, line up the um, Polaris, and before you do a go-to, make sure that the, the filter is on the lens. The thing about using a tracker is you have to make sure that your tracker can handle the weight of your camera and lens. A lot of them have a maximum uh, payload of 11 pounds, which should handle pretty much any camera and lens, but what happens is, depending upon the the um, the angle that you have to point the lens, it gets kind of tricky because the 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 motor can't handle it and it starts uh, skipping and it'll cause vibration and cause all kinds of nasty things. So definitely see if your tracker 
can handle the lens that you're planning to shoot with and go from there. Uh, as I said before, use weights to further uh, stabilize the tripod. And as far as shooting settings, the shooting settings that we went over earlier apply to using your tracker as well. Don't use the app to, to uh, chain, for the camera to be fired by the app. Um, use, uh, fire the thing uh, on its own and just use the tracker to track. And keep in mind that wind will mess up the works with the tracker, especially with a big lens. So have a plan B in place. So don't just plan to use the tracker because if it's very windy, your uh, the whole thing is going to be like a sail and just cause uh, potential problems. You can also shoot a time lapse with a tracker. Um, so use the the intervalometer settings for the time lapse on the camera and not use the the time lapse function of the tracker itself. Um, so play with it and see what works. Um, but I would rather have total control myself over the camera for the time lapse and not have the tracker do the time lapse for me. Any questions about using a tracker before we get into time lapse? OK. So for shooting a time lapse, um, the the smaller the um, interval between each frame, the smoother your time lapse will be. And the the goal for a time lapse, basically the rule of thumb, is that you want to have a minimum of 300 frames for a 10 second time lapse. 10 seconds is like the minimum length of time for a video, or it leaves the viewer unsatisfied. Um, but for a solar eclipse, you're going to have much more than 300 frames, rather. So that's just the rule of thumb. So a time lapse is multi-purpose. Uh, you can stack the frames as well. You can pull out individual frames. And you can shoot a time lapse either with a wide angle or a telephoto view. Use your solar filter, no matter which lens you use. And again, uh, during totality, make sure you remove the solar uh, filter only at totality. And you have to use, be careful because when you move anything um, during a sequence of a time lapse, that movement is very apparent in the video. And assess your framing uh, with a composition capture the time span that you want. Again, visualize. So how many frames are we talking about? Well, a lot. So here is, uh, again, planet. And this is the sequence. So I'm not going to start my time at 2.05 since the, the eclipse started at like 2.14. But I am going to give it some buffer because I want some, uh, like a, a leading amount of time prior to the eclipse, so it doesn't go smack into the eclipse. So I'll probably start it at 2, 210. And if I shoot the entire duration of the eclipse, I'm looking at like a lot of photographs, over 4,000, almost 5,000, depending on the interval. And looking at a 20 millimeter um, focal length, I'll be able to get the entire sequence with this framing using a 20 millimeter lens with a ton of photographs. Use a time-lapse calculator app to help you understand how much space you need and how, how many photographs you're going to be shooting. And there's a lot of free freebies out there. This is the one that I use, and it's pretty handy. So you basically put in the interval, the length of time, so it's a, a about uh, 2.3 hours totality um, from end beginning it to end of the eclipse. And with a frame rate of 30 frames per second, um, I'm going to be shooting about 4,050 4, frames. 
And with my sensor, which is 47 megapixels, I'm looking at about 189.1 gigabytes of storage that I'm going to be needing on my card. So based on the cards that I have, I'm okay. But this is something that you should look into to make sure that you don't run out of space when you're shooting. And here's a, a little um, uh, video that uh, Planet gives me so I can see what it's going to look like at different focal lengths. So at 300 millimeters, it's going to give me a nice, um, a nice visual of the sun. It's nice and large. I'm going to change it to 500 millimeter. And it'll give me uh, an even bigger sun. But now I won't be able to get the whole thing in the time lapse um, in the frame because now I'm shooting a big sun. But then I can consider, do I want to shoot just the totality? From the beginning of totality at the point in time, you get the Bailey beads, then the diamond ring, and right through. I can do that as well because it's not going to uh, take up a lot of uh, time. So that's a possibility for a time lapse. And you'll still end up with, uh, you know, quite a few images because you're going to shoot them off rapidly. But you can just capture a time lapse of totality right before and right after. So that's a possibility. If you're going to do the interval timer shooting uh, in your camera, uh, you just go to interval timer shooting. This is specific to the Nikon, but all the camera brands that have interval timer shooting have, uh, they might call it maybe a little bit different, but it's basically interval timer something, photography or whatever. And that's where you would set your, your uh, time lapse up. And this is, a, <clears throat> excuse me, an animation of what to expect. And it kind of goes through totality pretty fast, but totality is um, actually longer depending where, where you be. But that's the diamond ring. There's a second diamond ring. And um, you can capture something like this, but granted, you'll have uh, a longer span of time than what this is giving you. And practice shooting on the moon. What this does is it gets you accustomed to the process, just like shooting the sun during daytime. But when the, the moon is in crescent mode, you end up getting the, uh, the range of exposure because now you're dealing with the, the crescent moon that's very bright, but you plan your exposure because you want to get the earth shine on the other side of the moon that you can capture, but you have to figure out your settings. And each camera is going to be behaving a little bit different, so you want to know what it, what you need to do. So uh, consider shooting the moon as well when it's crescent. Excuse me. So here's, um, I did some testing with the KNF solar filter, and here's my rig. And I'm using the Manfrotto uh, head and this is what I ended up with. So this is at ISO 100, F11, 250th of a second at 500 millimeter. And if you look at the sunspots, they're very sharp. And that's what your goal is. Um, and if you look at the perimeter of the sun, it's pretty jagged because it is a ball of gas. So it's not solid. But practice with your solar filter as much as you can. And this is from 2017. Again, uh, lots of clouds, but shoot anyway, because you can still see it. Your camera can see it. So don't get put off by some clouds. Situate, uh, recently, we had a solar eclipse early morning, and it was super sucked in. And I couldn't see it, but my long lens and my camera could see the eclipse. Uh, very, very, very cloudy, as you can see. And this is the beginning. This is uh, the start. 
And with a crop sensor, um, it's a little bit, um, you know, you get the 750 on a 500 millimeter lens because it's one times, one and a half times um, the magnification on a crop. But it's pretty cool to see the, um, the, the progression. Uh, this is 2017. This is at maximum at the 2017 eclipse. As it goes off, and you can still see the sunspots, even though it was ridiculously cloudy. And this is a, a cropped in image, and you could see again sun, uh, the various amount of sunspots. And one thing I want to re remind you is it's such a rare occur uh, occurrence. And as photographers, we tend to get wound up with, you know, the photography and we lose track of the actual experience being present. So enjoy the, the experience and make sure that you remember to look up and see with your eyes and not just through the lens, the camera lens and look around you, see what's happening, see what's changing while the sun gets uh, obscured. And I uh, noted the upcoming events in terms of the eclipses and the moon. And these are the resources, uh, Sky and Telescope. I recommend Alan Dyer's uh, ebook, eclipse2024.org, timeanddate.com, NASA and astronomy. Uh, but probably the heavy hitters are these top four. Uh, more so than uh, these two, believe it or not. But th there's a wealth of information uh, on these four here. And thank you. Okay, questions? You guys uh, awake? Uh, Sleep? Uh, yeah, so, Silvana, just to uh, just to re recap, I guess the your first purpose for doing the presentation. Just to recap the safety issues, my understanding is you never want to look through the viewfinder, yep. so it's a good, good idea to place a piece of tape over it. Um, you want to make sure you have a pair of those ISO-approved glasses and don't monkey around with uh, photo film stuff like that. Um, and then to protect your camera, the solar filter is of primary importance, right? Make sure you get a good uh, solar filter. Yes, so, I'm gonna have to, you know, re. I'm gonna have to redo your presentation to get the names and so forth. But, um, you know, you either the screw on type or the what do you call it, the full aperture thing that. Yeah, full aperture. Goes on the outside. You can tape it on. So, those are the main two considerations: protect your eyes. You never want to look through it, and then protect your camera. Uh, with the third or a good solar filter, don't try and substitute a bunch of ND filters or something like that. Yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. Does that kind of sum up the safety issues? Yes, definitely use a proper solar filter. Uh, make sure that you use a proper solar shade for your eyes. Um, another thing that we photographers tend to ignore is the most important camera, which is your eye. So make sure you use yeah. a uh, solar, um, you know, they're ISO certified solar shades. So you want to make sure you have those. Do not use a, uh, your your sunglasses and don't use, you know, the, the, th the stuff that you've heard in the past with CD and or DVD discs. Uh, all those things are not protective. So you want to make sure that you use proper protection for your camera. Um, I've used a full aperture filter for years. Uh, probably decades because I've ported it over from my telescope and it works very well on my camera lens as well. So if you plan on shooting the the sun um, for, you know, getting into the, the groove of shooting the sun, definitely consider buying a sol you know, a full aperture one because we are gear hounds and we tend to change gear a lot. And you don't want to have a filter that you spend a lot of money on. And some of the, 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 the screw-in filters can be expensive. Some of them are inexpensive, like the KNF one is fairly inexpensive. So you can buy a bunch of them, and that's perfectly fine. But some of them are 
ridiculously expensive, the screw on one. So you don't want to have a filter that you're going to outgrow. But the, the full aperture one, um, I can use the one that I have, I can use on my 200 to, to 500 millimeter lens, which has a filter size of 95 millimeter. And I also can use it on my F4 500 millimeter, which has the drop in filter, which has a huge front end. So that one solar filter, that full aperture, I can put on both lenses. I don't have to go, okay, I need different different filters because, oh, it's not going to fit my other big lens. So that's the benefit of using a full aperture. Just keep in mind the future. But um, again, it depends upon your finances. Don't be afraid to just get a screw-in filter on the cheap, like that KNF that I showed you what, I, what it, it gave me. That's a very good filter um, for solar photography and it's cheap it's inexpensive i got that on amazon and it does a great job so think about that um and think about your goals for shooting the sun uh regarding the uh the, the uh, glasses for your eyes do you know if bnh has those uh, iso things on sale I don't know if uh, B&H does. They probably do because everybody has them. Uh, you can even contact Hunts. Hunts has them. Uh, and they're inexpensive. And I would recommend get the um, get the kind that have like a plastic frame as opposed to the cardboard frames. Um, they're more like proper glasses. And they're not flimsy. And they work very well. And they're cheap. They're inexpensive. Uh, if they're they're charging an arm and a leg, which I guarantee you for sunshades and filters, the prices are going to be uh, starting to go up. So keep that in mind. Buy your gear now rather than later because the prices are going up. Do you have any recommendations on what filters to use for cell phones? That I don't because I I I can't give you anything because I, I don't have any, any experience that, with shooting the sun or, or anything with a cell phone. So I I can't give you a recommendation without any experience myself. Thank you. I'm, so, I'm sorry. And what one other question, I, I think you said on a mirrorless camera, we can look through the viewfinder correctly versus going live view? Yes. Because okay. you're looking, you're actually looking, for all intents and purposes, live view is always active on a mirrorless camera, whether or not you're looking at the LCD or through the viewfinder. But you don't have a reflection of the mirror uh, on a mirrorless camera, so you're fine. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Yeah. So when we're sh when we're shooting moonrises, we're uh, it's we always look for the full moon, and it's easy and fun because we could look for objects on land to frame it against. But the sun's going to be fairly high in the sky. So can you offer any advice about composition for something that's got an elevation of 30, 30 degrees? You know, we're not in Utah where we have like beautiful you know rock formations that we can use. Right. Well, I think this is a, a case of determining where you're going to be shooting. So if you're going to be shooting, say, in Vermont and Burlington, um, unless you're like right along Lake Champlain and you have a pretty foreground, that's really where you want to think about using a very wide angle lens, perhaps a 20 millimeter or even a 24 or 14 millimeter. And if the sun is very high, you're going to want to think about Am I going to do single shots? Am I going to be doing a time lapse? Um, how important the foreground is? Because as you said, we don't have, you know, the, the foreground is not something that we're guaranteed to have a pretty location. Because I guarantee you too, given the, um, the location where the totality is happening, also consider the amount of people that are going to be in the location. So we're going to fight a lot of other people, not necessarily photographers, that are going to be going to the same place. So it's like kind of a catch-22. Do we want to just look at the sun or be like, you know, encasing the, the, the foreground element as well? So 
for myself, I would probably go with the idea of if I can't get to the location that has the pretty, this is like that plan A, plan B, plan C business. If I can't get to the location because of traffic or amount of people that are going to be in the same place, like in, on Lake Champlain in Burlington, then I want to be able to shoot this wherever without a foreground and just focus on the sun. Then my whole plan changes. It goes from landscape mode to full on 500 millimeter lens or 300 millimeter lens. So this is something that you have to uh, consider in your planning and be able to shift accordingly because there are going to be crowds and there are going to be uh, problems with getting to where you think you want to be. So hope that answers your questions in terms it of, does. thank okay. you. You're welcome. Silvana. Yeah. Um, we have this um, Hyder solar filter. It's an ND one with six zeros. That's a 20 stop, I believe. Is that too much? No, there's no such thing as too much, but you want to make sure that it is made for the sun. It is a solar filter. Then you're fine. Okay. Yeah. It has to say solar. Just don't, don't consider a, uh, you know, it'll be good to point your camera at the, the sun uh, and not, it will be protective of the of the sensor. That's the whole thing. I mean, our sensors can take UV, infrared, and and uh, visible light clearly, but the problem is is um, having a filter that will protect it. Uh, I mean, for the longest duration that we'll have our sensor exposed is probably a second, which is fine for those ND filters. But we want to make sure that for one that's for that single second of exposure that ND filter is is suited for solar photography, which it sounds like it is. If you have a link, I can probably take a look at it as well. It's this one. Oh, you're fine. That one's uh, specific for sun. You're yes. good. Good, thank you. You're welcome. So Silvana, this is probably an incredibly stupid question, but- no. I'm envisioning that the sun is incredibly difficult to focus on. It is. So how are you obtaining focus? I mean, manual focus, but are you, do you look at the rim of the sun? Cause there's nothing else to grasp to focus. We are actually lucky that we can actually focus on the sunspots. We are in solar oh. maximum now. So even at, 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 at the low activity on the other end of, of the, the solar cycle where there's only a few sunspots, the sunspot is your goal. If your sunspots are sharp, you've got, you've got fo focus. If they're fuzzy or soft looking, um, keep trying because sometimes the clarity of the atmosphere will affect that as well. But you want to have your sunspots sharp. Thank you. That makes sense. You're welcome. Let's see, do mirrorless cameras have any advantages or disadvantages for eclipse photography? Um, there are there are no, the only advantage is, is that it doesn't have a mirror. So you, you won't accidentally uh, mess up your eyesight by looking in the viewfinder. That's really the only advantage. But in terms of sensor, uh, a sensor on a on a mirrorless is the same sensor as a DSLR. There's no difference between that. It's just how it's um, how it's capturing or rather, rather focusing because it uses the mirror for focus. Silvana. Yeah. Mary. Hi, Mary. Hi. <laughs> Are you going to be in Maine on April 8th? I am not. Um, mm -hmm. Actually, I don't know because I'm making plans. I'm either going to be in Maine, New Hampshire. New York or Vermont. <laughs> Texas would be great too because it's blue bonnet time. Yes. Texas. Anyway, uh, in regards to focusing, can we just set it on infinity? <sighs> Shooting not... at infinity. Yeah. You, it, uh, with the Z lens, you could probably do that um, yeah. because when you turn uh, a Nikon on, a, a Nikon mirrorless, and you have a Nikon Z lens on it, when yeah. you turn it on, it automatically goes to infinity. Mm -hmm. um, I have an F lens, so I have to focus. Yeah. So if you have a Z lens, uh, setting it to infinity, you should be go good. Okay. Mm. Hey, hope to see you sometime. Thank Same you. Same here. You're welcome. <laughs> okay. The key KNF filters don't say for solar. I, the the KNF uh, solar filter does say folder. 
uh, solar rather, I can't speak English anymore. So my guess is you're not on the right one for solar because there is an ND 10,000 and that is not solar. It specifically says solar for the KNF one and I can get the link. Oh, that's cool. Thousand Oak solar, fi solar filter material for iPhone shooting. That's a good link. Thank you, Grant. Like, there's a lot of good uh, comments here and links. Thank you, Will. So yeah, then, yes. Uh, is there a preference or one better than the other between crop sensor and full sensor? No. The only thing is, is the crop sensor will extend your focal length on, uh, say you have a full frame lens, say 500 millimeter, and you put that on a crop sensor, um, it'll extend the focal length because uh, for Canon, it's 1.6. The Multiply the, the focal length of the lens times 1.6. And for Nikon, it's uh, focal length times 1.5. So like one of the pictures that I showed, actually several of them, um, I shot it with a crop sensor Nikon, a D7100. And I used a full frame 500 millimeters. So the effective focal length was 750 for that. So the crop sensor will extend it. Um, the only caveat to using a crop sensor on a, uh, a like a, uh, a shorter focal length is that if you plan on cropping, um, that's where uh, crop sensors kind of lose it. Because if you're cropping tight, that's when you get pixelation. So it's a balancing act. But if you have a long focal length lens, you're good to go. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh, more links. Thank you. You guys are great. Let's see. Yes, Chris, that is a good lens. The Case Wolverine, it's the 100,000 ND. And that one there with the orange rim, that is a solar filter. I don't have any experience with solar trackers. Um, only, you know, Astro uh, trackers, both the, um, you know, the go-to mounts on a telescope and the Benro Polaris and also the Sky Watcher. And those are all Astro, but I'm thinking the solar trackers probably work the same way, but that's a guess. I don't really have any experience with them. Let's see, KNF. Yes, that's the correct uh, filter. That's the one that I, I took the uh, the picture of the sun with that I showed you the KNF that uh, Nancy. That's the one. Let's see. Yeah, good point, Prasant. Um, they're starting to dwindle, so definitely. Um, Make sure that you order your filter sooner than later because the, the stuff's flying off the shelf. It's all of a sudden people are getting on the, the Eclipse bandwagon and going, ooh, I want to do this. And um, you don't want to miss out. Last time, I think they ran out of filters. So if you don't have one yet, definitely get one. All right, I got to go. Let's see how we doing for time. Well, we're almost uh, out of time. Any more questions? You said that KF that was just on there. The KF as long as it's a hundred thousand, that's okay. The hundred thousand is good. Uh, make sure it has six zeros and not five. <laughs> I, I have one question. No. Oh. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. I had it wrong. It's a hundred thousand, not ten thousand. I have my zeros wrong. Yes, Philip. <laughs> yeah. You, so you're going to be uh, sending us a link. For the live stream or the, uh, the the YouTube, will you also be sending out copies of the slides? That I don't, but I will send out uh, the settings if okay. that helps you. Yeah, and the, so the the looking up the uh, the, the attached 
Aperture, the uh, what? What's a brand of that again, if you don't mind? For the uh, uh, oh, for the for the uh, filter, the the aperture. Um, oh, the full aperture. The full aperture. Okay, there's a a few brands. Um, there is here. Let me pull up the slide. There's a few of them that are very good that I recommend. Um, and uh, sometimes on Amazon, what I discover is there's um like like eBay sometimes you find that they're not legitimate products they're like uh, um, bogus ones so you have to be careful with stuff like this um, let me see and by the way thank you so much for the presentation very 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 informative uh, a lot of a lot of good advice <laughs> you're very welcome yeah. I, I'm really happy to do this. Okay, so for the full aperture filters, there's Kendrick, Astro Instruments, Astro Zap, Celestron, Orion Telescope, which is actually Mead Telescope, Bader Planetarium, and Thousand Oaks Optical. These all make um, really, really good full aperture filters. And I think on that email that I sent out regarding the filters, um, they were listed. And oh, okay. And, and we can purchase them through uh, Hunt or B&H as well. Or do you recommend actually going to the manufacturer? Uh, go through the manufacturer if you can, um, because B&H, um, they're very good. If they have it on stock, they'll immediately ship it. Uh, I, get, I got mine, a new one. Uh, don't judge me. I have several filters. Uh, I got a Kendrick Astro Instrument filter. And I got it directly from them. So, and they're the, all these guys are small companies. So sometimes if you just go direct, you're supporting them because uh, a big, bigger retailer is not taking a chunk of the pie, but it's entirely up to you. No, and again, you. and another thing to consider too, is if they don't have it in stock, uh, they're going to have to get it directly from these guys. So cut out the middleman. Great. No, thank you. You're welcome. Not to belabor a point, but the um, I'm looking at the KNF filters, but uh, and they look the same. You know, they're both either a hundred thousand or a million. And you look on the KNF site, they say solar, but if you look on Amazon, they don't. So I'm just wondering if there could be a difference. Uh, go by well. The the thing is, the description on the the Amazon site. Um, I go by UPC code. If the UPC code on the manufacturer of the site is the same as the one on the retailer site, then you know you're getting the same thing. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah, but because descriptions, sometimes they just, you don't know who's typing the stuff in. <laughs> yeah, okay, thank but you. You're thank welcome. you very much, yeah. No, that, uh, that one that you got, Nancy, is good. Let's see, any questions here? Okay, what do you recommend for IR on a full spectrum converted camera? So for infrared, this is where it gets a little little wonkified. So if you have a full spectrum camera and you're gonna shoot full spectrum, all you do is put the filter on top of it, the solar filter. If you're planning on shooting a at a at a, a particular nanometer, um, like a 720 or a 680 or a 590, and um, what you do is you put the 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 IR filter at, at for whatever wavelength on the camera, and then you put the solar filter on top of it. So you always put a always use your solar filter even on an infrared. Um, but in order to block out specific wavelengths, you want to make sure that you you put a um, the what you call it there the the infrared filter underneath the solar filter. Does that make sense? That was Laura's question. She's still here. Okay. Any more questions? Sylvan, I have a quick question. I have a mirrorless camera and I'm noticing the K and F, they all say for DSLRs, but is it? No. It's I fine. can use it on both. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. 
Again, so it's the people typing in the information. Yes. What's the advantage of using full spectrum versus, say, a 720 or an 8 or 680? Uh, full spectrum, it'll, it'll pick up. Um, the full spectrum runs the gamut. It's basically your, 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 your camera sensor uh, without any filter on it at all. So it'll pick up, if it picks up any uh, kind of wavelength, it'll pick it up. Um, putting a, a filter on it is effectively blocking specific wavelengths. Um, so it, it depends upon what your goals are. Like uh, the, the sun has, well, let me back up. So the solar filter itself will block out a lot of wavelengths, but it's still designed to um, block out harmful wavelengths or the intensity rather of the of the sun itself. Um, if you're shooting with an infrared camera, you can shoot with the full spectrum with the solar filter. And to be honest with you, I haven't played with mine yet, but I intend on shooting with it, with the sun uh, today with it. Um, it's sunny right now for now, but, uh, and see what happens. I know for photographers that shoot the sun through telescopes, they use filters a lot with the solar filter. And I think the same thing applies to your infrared camera. Does that make sense? Did I just go down a rabbit hole and not answer your question? <laughs> I think you answered it. Thanks. Oh, thank you. Ah, that's interesting. What filter do you recommend for ideal IR shooting? Hmm. That's a good question because um, the classic IR is 720. Um, but if you look at, and we're talking about film days, that was like your 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 standard infrared filter that would block out most of the visible light and only give you from like 720 nanometers up to 900. Um, but there is really no ideal, in my opinion, IR filter. It's what you like. And if you think of Aerochrome, Kodak Aerochrome, that was basically 550 nanometers. So it was capturing some of, actually quite a bit of the visible spectrum as well as all the infrared and it gave you that intense red um, color. So uh, it depends on what you like. I don't think there's really an answer for what an ideal is. Good question, Edward. Any more questions? So you're you're going to uh, shoot with a full spectrum without any blockage except the solar filter. You're going to try gonna, that. I'm going to try doing full spectrum, no filter, and then trying a 590, and then trying a 720 and a 680. Because 680 is pretty much where H alpha is. So I want to see what it looks like. If you guys are interested, I can send you pictures of what I end up with. But you would always have the solar filter on, right? Always. Always. Or else you'll fry your camera. Yeah. Never, ever shoot, regardless of the camera, never shoot without a solar filter. Uh, the intervalometer, I just use a cheaper, cheapo, newer uh, intervalometer on Amazon. And you just get it for the camera that you have. And it's about 20 bucks, and it works very, very well. Uh, let's see. Let me get you a link. So this one here is the Nikon one for newer, but it, they have all kinds of ones for different cameras. Uh, 
Uh -huh. Something, Steve, you never want to think about. How will you know if your sensor has been damaged, assuming it's not destroyed? For example, if you are late putting a filter back on after totality. Well, if you start seeing, um, you take images and they're just bad uh, or have like areas of blowout, then you pretty much cooked your, your sensor. So the key is putting that, put, put timers on, put a stopwatch on during totality and make sure that you get that thing on. Even if you knock it out of position, point, you know, if you're like, oh God, um, still pointing at the sun and I don't, I, I can't get to it fast enough. If you have it on a gimbal, push that, that lens down before you fry your, your camera. Could you, oh, that's an interesting one. Folk, could you focus on the moon in advance and then tape the focus ring? Yeah, I don't see why not. Mm -hmm. That's a good one. So Laura said, could you focus on the moon in advance and then tape the focus ring and then be set for focus on the sun? I think that's a good, uh, good way to try it and test it. Uh, tonight, um, the moon should be out late. Uh, focus on the moon, tape it down, and then tomorrow, try it with your solar filter um, and see how the sun looks. If you're, if the sunspots are sharp, you just solve the problem. That's that's a great way to do it because the sun is hard to to focus, very hard, harder than you think, and actually difficult to find in the viewfinder with a long telephoto lens. It's big, but it's hard to find. But I like that a lot. Good tip. Let's see. Did I hear you say that you like to um, tape yours to your, um, not to the lens, but to the... To the hood? To yeah, the hood. The, the full spectrum filter, yes. Yeah. Just that one, the full spectrum? Uh, no, yeah, the the not the full spectrum. I'm sorry, I'm fried at this point. The full aperture one, the telescope, uh, solar filter. So I use that uh, on a the lens hood itself, and just use some gaffer tape just to keep it a little bit more snug. But yeah, not the screw in filters, just the full aperture one. I put on the hood. Do you use the glass one? I have both the glass and the um. The, the the film one. I just bought the film one. I and, have to go pee. Oh, someone's someone's gotta go. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Any more questions? Thank you. Oh, Thank you're you welcome. Man. This has been great. Thanks very much. Thank you all for joining me. Thank you, Savannah. And uh, you should be it's able to fabulous. see. I'm sorry. Thank you so much. It was fabulous. No, thank you. Really appreciate you guys joining me this morning. And please do share your your solar eclipse pictures. I'd love to see them. And you should be able to see the um, the live stream through that link, which I'll send out again with the uh, the setting information. I just have one more quick question. Just so I'm just trying to make, make sure I sure. understand. For the I'm looking at the K and F filter. Is mm -hmm. the 20 stop ultra dark ND effect better than the like I think it was the 16.6 .6, or is it just like mm -hmm. is it better to get the more stops? Not necessarily. Um, I would go if you look at the make sure it says solar. Um, not sure the 20 stops says solar. I think that's equivalent to, to stacking two 10 stop yeah. NDs. Yeah. I wouldn't go with that one. I would okay. go with the solar one. The one that says specifically solar. Yeah, I think I'm just going to go because I went on to their website and the prices are exactly the same. So I'd rather just go on to their website, buy from them direct and then see the word solar somewhere. Yeah. Okay, definitely. thank you. You're thank very you so welcome. Much. This was great. I really do appreciate you doing this. No, my pleasure. Um, I, I hope uh, we're all successful and no clouds wherever we are. <laughs> Pray for sun. Pray for sun. Yes. 
All right. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Silvana. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Have a good day. You too. Thank you.